Welcome, Feel Good Fathers. I have Joe Sanok of the new book, Thursday is the New Friday. Tons of great discussion here about the four, the four-day work week, HBR articles, the whole deal. But we're really going to talk about a handful of things. Number one, setting the intention of your family and what you want your kids to do when they're leaving the home. Number two, we had a really interesting conversation off air about chores and the neuroscience behind them, hard and soft boundaries, and a little bit of backstory on Joe and his life. Welcome to the show, Joe. Jay, I am so excited to hang out with you and all the listeners today. Awesome. I'm really excited. So let's talk a little bit through uh, a little bit of your backstory. So you have kind of an interesting situation. We'd love to know more about it, and then we'll jump right in. Yeah. So uh, professionally, I was trained as a psychologist and a counselor. So I went through all the typical like work at nonprofits, community mental health, uh, opened a counseling practice uh, of my own that I was working concurrently while I had my full-time job starting 2006 or so I started that um, and then grew that group practice uh, and sold that in 2019. Uh, and have uh, really been podcasting about the business of private practice since 2012. We're uh, at the time of this recording about to hit episode 1000. So um, really the Practice the Practice podcast was all about just kind of all those things we didn't learn in grad school as therapists and helping professionals. So marketing, blogging, how do you get clients? How do you run profit and loss statements? Uh, and so I get to interview people five days a week around those kind of topics. Uh, and then, you know, outside of that, you know, I married uh, my high school sweetheart. We had gone off to college, came back together. Um, but then during the pandemic, I uh, went on a road trip and lived in national parks during that and uncoupled uh, while we were on the road. And she stayed in California and I came home with the kids. So I uh, became an unexpected single dad. And, you know, like when I look back on it, depending on how much we want to dig into trauma and life changes, uh, you know, it was a really good thing. Uh, I, I love being a single dad. I have a very healthy partner now and um but it was a shift you know so so that's that's me in a nutshell like practice the practice and single dad <laughs> boom i i love it and i'm i'm so uh number one on the business side i think that one of the the things i do professionally is i help people build their brand so i help them basically build a, a business around their expertise and what i love about experts it's very similar to your mission is that with experts, you're busy spending your time doing thought leadership. You're you're busy spending your time serving your clients. You're busy trying to get your message out there, but you're not necessarily learning about the business of being a business. Mm -hmm. And it's really challenging. And so first, congratulations on a thousand episodes. That's awesome. There'll be a link down in the description. Um, but then number two, I think helping people that have a heart to give and that have some sort of capacity to do that. I think that's such a like virtuous pursuit. Uh, uh, okay. So enough of us loving on each other. Um, <laughs> so there it is. So uh, our first topic was, um, what are the, what actually is kind of a legacy? And so this is, these aren't the terms that we used, but you had a really interesting thought and I would love for you to jump in for us. Like what actually is your familial legacy as a father? Yeah. You know, a lot of people ask me in having a business, but then also being a single dad, I often get the question of like, how do you manage it all? How do you think about parenting? Just all those different types of questions. And, you know, it really over the years has made me think through, okay, like what is my method if I were to really distill it down? And I think when I think about my own childhood experience, I was raised by a psychologist and a school nurse, two like very healthy people overall. Every parent has their flaws and every parent has their triumphs. Um, but the things that I took into adulthood, um, my dad was a cognitive behavioral psychologist. So star charts, like reinforcers. So one of the big things I took is you have to work hard to get rewards. Now that has mm. positive sides. It also has negative sides. Cause I feel like even if I do well, like I have to earn everything that's given to me. And so thinking about my own childhood, there's probably three or five messages that I really took into adulthood, despite thousands of hours that my parents came to soccer games and did all sorts of stuff for me that maybe those aren't the messages they really wanted me to take into adulthood, but I ended up taking them into adulthood. So I've really thought through like, what are the things for my two daughters? So at the time of this recording, they're nine and 13. Uh, what do I want them when they turn 18 or 21 or 25, when their brains fully develop that they say, here's what dad gave us. Uh, and so thinking through for one, uh, it's being able to talk to anybody. 
uh, no matter how much AI we have, no matter how much texting we have, a person that can have a conversation like you and I are having where, man, I just met you five minutes ago and I feel like I want to hang out with this dude more. Like we both have the skill to talk to people. That's yeah. not going to go away as a power that is needed. So no matter how much happens in the world, that's crazy. If you can connect with people, if you can carry on conversations with people, that's going to be valuable. So that, that's one area that I've said, I want my girls to be awesome at that. So a perfect example, we're over at my, my partner Claire's parents' house. Uh, they've been there a bunch of times. We prep ahead of time to say, okay, Claire's parents are having their friends over. So other folks that are 70 years old, you can't just bring your coloring books and disengage. So let's talk ahead of time about how do you talk to other people? Like, what could you, what could you ask them? You could ask them, you know, are you retired? What did you do for work? Uh, what was that like for you? What do you enjoy about retirement? Are you traveling soon? And there's going to be a back and forth, kind of a ping pong of conversation. So my nine and 12 year old plop down on the couch next to these brand new people they just met. And they're like, so how's life going? It's like what nine and she was 12 at the time, nine and 12 year olds sit down and like ask 70 year olds they've never met. Tell me about your life. Like that sounds hard for you. Like that's amazing. You know, and they ended up not pulling their coloring books out for the entire dinner. They sat and chatted with these brand new people for the whole time. So those are the skills that don't just happen when someone turns 18. It's not a, oh, shoot, as a parent, I forgot to teach you how to talk to people. That has to happen over the lifetime. Now, that may not be the thing that you want to teach your own kids, but for me, that's a value. Uh, for me also, I want to have hard work be part of who they are, that there's a sense of responsibility for your space, a sense of responsibility for what you've signed up for. Uh, but I don't want it to be a checklist. Uh, when I was a kid, I knew my allowance was tied to about three tasks. And when I was done with those tasks, it was like, I don't need to help around the house anymore. I finished the dishes. I finished the vacuuming. I don't need to help. To me, that's being a bad roommate. So I use that term with my daughters. I'm like, I'm your dad, but you're also my roommate. Roommates don't just say one of you has to always take out the recycling. No, like if I need you to take out the recycling because I'm busy making dinner, like I'm being a good roommate by making you dinner. So you need to be a good roommate by taking out the recycling. Now, if that feels unequal, we can talk about that. We can respectfully advocate for our position. But then that means that we actually need to have a voice in regards to talking as roommates. And then the third area that I've really focused in on is that idea of having a voice. Um, you know, women, you know, throughout society have been property, they've been underpaid, they've all sorts of, you know, feminist and historical values that we can talk about. And I want my daughters to feel like they can advocate. Now, Jay, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, if my parents said something to me, it was you either listen or you're in trouble. Now, as mm. an adult, that's not how the world works. There's times when someone tells you to do something and you shouldn't do it. You know, there's teachers that may ask you to do something inappropriate. There may be scout leaders or all sorts of people that you need to know as a young woman that you can push back. So I've added a middle thing that if I say I want you to take out the recycling, for example, you can say yes and do it. You won't ever get in trouble for just following my instructions. You can say no, you're probably going to get in trouble or you can respectfully advocate for your position. You can say, dad, I'm in the middle of homework right now. Can you give me five minutes to wrap this up and then I'll do it? Or dad, I had a busy day at school. Can I do that tomorrow? If you do it in a respectful way and it's not urgent, most likely I'm going to say, okay, that, that makes sense. Now, there may be times I say, this is not a time to respectfully advocate. I need you to take out the recycling. Like recycling trucks come in in two minutes, take it out right now. But what that's done is it's created a voice in these young women to respectfully advocate in ways for things that maybe they didn't realize they had a voice in. I um, I absolutely adore as a girl dad myself. I absolutely adore this this line of languaging. I, it's so funny. I just watched a it was a Jay Shetty show YouTube channel, and I was watching it. It was about a, a psychologist. He had been doing it for like thirty five years, and he said one of the rules is um, when I ask you to do something the first time, you do it, so I don't have to repeat myself. And it, it, it's so funny because in my life, it's been so interesting because number one, I have the same, the same idea that advocacy, the pushing back, right. I, and I did defiance, like I've been calling it like the defiance and I don't want to encourage defiance. That, and what I'm realizing is that that's not really the, the principle I want, I want, but advocacy, I love it like self-advocacy. And so there are certain times, um, and so cultivating that effectively and then having that conversation, 
I love that. I think that's like super awesome. And I love the, the boundaries around it, which is like another thing that we're going to talk about later on, Mm -hmm. but the boundaries around what is respectful advocacy, what's disrespectful, uh, communicating that. I love the idea of roommate. That's something that I hadn't really built around. I've been trying to instill more of that internal household respect and like pride in what's going on in the house. Mm -hmm. But I'm understanding now it's like, Oh, like roommate, like, Hey, this is a roommate thing. You, you need to learn how to do this. Um, that's super awesome. So what we've gone through really is this concept, very familiar to feel good fathers of intentionality, intending to figure out, um, intending to figure out like who our kids are and what does it mean to be in here and then doing a skill transfer. You know, if you've got a, a skill or a competency transferring that to your kids, I, I don't think there's anything, there's no better way to help them thrive. And you can either do it intentionally by trying to build a culture and trying to build behavior, or you can do it unintentionally, in which case our kids are parrot. They're just going to do, they're going to be you, the, both the good and the bad of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's interesting in thinking about the advocacy side, um, it, it really came to light in a very unique way. So I, this podcaster I knew, he he's probably 10 years older than me. And so his daughters are in their mid twenties. And he said that when they turned 13 and 16, when they were 13, they could go on a trip with their mom anywhere in the U S and when they were 16, they could go on a trip with their dad. Now being that I'm basically mom and dad as a single dad with like 95% custody, I'm like, well, I'll do both. So I had announced to my, my daughters, okay, when you turn 13, this is what's going to happen. So my daughter who actually on the day of this recording is turning 13. Um, I told her this, you know, anywhere in the U S for like a kind of long weekend. Um, and she started looking at, places that she wanted to go. Um, and her name's Lucia and she'd always wanted to go to St. Lucia, which is not in the United States. That is very much outside of it. It's quite a long flight away, but she looked at the cost of flights, um, in the U S and compared that to flights to St. Lucia found it was about $400 per ticket cheaper to fly to St. Lucia than it was to most places in the U S which shocked me. And then she looked as a 12 year old on Airbnb to see what the average price was at the time we wanted to travel and said, you know, it's the down season, it's going to be 100 to 150 dollars a night instead of the average, you know, 2 to 300 dollars a night. And basically respectfully advocated for going to the island of her dreams for her 13th birthday and saving me thousands of dollars. And so I feel like that was just such a great example of, wow, if I hadn't for years been teaching her that you can push back, you can not follow the rules assuming we have a respectful conversation, assuming that you know that I ultimately have the final say, but you have a voice in what your life looks like. Now we're going on this epic vacation that she designed and has a Trello board where she's keeping track of things on. It's like, what a cool life skill to learn how to plan a trip as a 12, 13 year old. That's awesome. I think that's like, that's super great. And uh, just for the feel good fathers, it's like, we're not discussing right now. We're not saying, Hey, this is what your kid should be like. What we're saying is Joe has, has spent some time to, to cultivate a specific behavior, right? Uh, almost like a bonsai tree, <laughs> like cultivating mm-hmm. it with specific behavior, setting boundaries around that, and then basically uh, reaping the rewards of that, uh, reaping the rewards of that. So, uh, so for instance, um, one of the big things for me in the, in a similar capacity was identified when, when my, my oldest was really young that she had this artistic eye. And so it's just been really kind of and I guess like the eye is not it because that's talking about taste, but the creation of art and her drawing skills. And now she's getting to this point. It's like she's creating near, um, uh, we're kind of in a cartoony anime style, like uh, a household right now. And so she's creating actual anime art, which is wow. uh, which is nuts. And so she just, she draws a couple hours every single day and just kind of continues to cultivate in, in that expression. And so it's been really interesting. Not probably not as useful as as uh, being able to advocate and and book a book a trip. You never know, man. <laughs> right, you never right. know where that's going to take someone. It could be anime. It could just be that she has a value for the arts, or she understands downtime as being okay. I mean, who knows? Yeah, yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Good, good point. This gets into so we kind of we got into a little bit here uh, off air about about. Um, um, the four hour work week. And so I want to queue up the conversation appropriately because I think it'll happen again naturally. So let's talk about this four hour work week and how, how we queue that up and how it benefits us as parents. 
Yeah. So the four day work week uh, with Thursday is the new Friday um, manifests in a lot of different ways. So if we just start with what's the research show us? So the largest evaluation of the four day work week, um, it was done in the UK. Um, it was, I think, 60 or 70,000 participants, like insane amount. Um, they found that overwhelmingly the amount of work people can get done in a 32 hour work week is about the same or better than a 40 hour work week. Meaning when you work a 40 hour work week, most likely you're donating those last eight hours to get nothing done. People do all sorts of things to waste time during the week, um, to plan their weekends, to chit chat at the cooler. Some of those things add value. Some of those things don't. Um, but as we start to look at different uh, case examples of this, more and more we're seeing that really the brain works better with a 32 hour work week. Um, sometimes when we think about just the way that we do work, it feels like this is just how it's always been. And so when I was writing Thursday is the new Friday, um, I started with a couple questions of, you know, where first, where did the week come from? Because if you think about it, a year makes sense because we go around, you know, the sun and, you know, that's a year, a day makes sense. Um, but when we look at weeks, there's nothing in nature that points to seven. Um, and so I looked at it and actually, uh, you know, the Egyptians, they had a 10 day, no, they had an eight day week. The Romans had a 10 day week. Even in the 1800s, the Russians were trying out a five day week. So it really was the Babylonians who looked up, they saw the sun and the moon, they looked down and saw the earth. And then the brightest other four stars or other planets were Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, and Mars. So they saw seven bright things and they said, let's do a seven day week. So even just starting that the week is totally made up. And then if we kind of fast forward from ancient history to the 1800s, the average person was working anywhere from 50 to 60 hours a week, 10 hour days, six to seven days a week. So in 1926, when Henry Ford started the 40 hour work week, he did it to sell more cars to the people that worked at Ford. He, they wanted, he wanted them Detroit. to have weekends. Yeah, he wanted them to have weekends. And he knew that in Detroit, and he starts paying to have roads paved in Southeast Michigan um, so that people could get out of Detroit to enjoy their weekends. And they bought cars from their own employer. So he's making money off his own employees. So we see that less than 100 years ago, the 40-hour work week really starts to take off. So we think about it, the, the generation that went to World War II was the first generation that was really experiencing a 40-hour work week. The baby boomers are the second. The Gen Xers and millennials are only the third. We are lightly into this experiment. Now, we look at how even Fridays started to fall off um, in the 90s. You know, we saw like TGIF on ABC. We saw the rise of casual Fridays. It's when we do you know, birthdays and anniversary parties or, you know, baby showers at work. Um, and then the pandemic, we just see that that was the final nail in the coffin for Fridays. Uh, and so what we've seen is there was already a rise of Fridays being a non-productive day for the workplace for the most part compared to a Monday through Thursday. So overall, we're seeing the science lines up with it. We're seeing all sorts of different uh, areas uh, find ways to do it. Golden, Colorado switched their entire city over to a four-day work week. So fire, um, EMS, police are now working four days uh, instead of doing five days plus. They've seen millions on overtime just by doing that and are attracting top talent. CNN did a huge thing about them. So we see that this really is that post-industrialist way of thinking um, and businesses that are doing it are really you know, finding that they can attract top talent. I think it's, I, I love the, the the history and everything there is, is super fascinating, but even then just there, post-industrial workload, right? We are not even, we're not even in the information age anymore. We are now into the AI age. And I think the, what I've loved about the pandemic, right? Is that it was kind of showing like the first experiment was if people are working from home, will they work as hard? And they, and I think like it was HBR that said, yeah, 96%. It's like, okay, 96%. And then I thought reflectively on, well, what's being eliminated by not being in the office? turning for the chit chat, getting, you know, I remember um, there was one place of work that I in particularly worked at when I was in the industry where it was like, I remember it was like, I would go and have a conversation about, I was in game design. So I'd have a conversation about game mechanics and see what was going on and talk about this game. I was playing with another guy kind of working through different mechanics. It was a mobile game. We were doing mobile game development. And it was like, if the conversation went to 21 minutes, so it was like if, and I timed it, it was like, if the conversation went to 21 minutes, 
uh, the development director would come over and talk to me and <laughs> just like mm. interrupt the conversation and stuff like that. I was like, we're talking about these kind of things. I may be away from my desk, but this is at an actual creative conversation. We're exploring different things and we're building community uh, on the same thing. So I was like, what's the issue here? Like what's going on? Um, and it was just like, just, you know, typical nonsense. Um, respect the dude didn't respect the argument. Um, mm. But I thought it was like, it was really interesting because I was like, okay, so back to the pandemic, everybody's working from home. You're getting rid of some of these elements. And so um, I guess it's really like, what is the, there's a mental health value and component of being around other people and having, and having that conversation and being able to creatively come to a solution and getting out of the house and creating that boundary and separation. But then there's that other side of like maximal productivity. So I, I'm kind of curious here on in this study with Colorado, was this applicable to all kinds of work? Um, like we talked yeah, about so, fire and police. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So the UK study that was across multiple industries, Colorado, that's the city of Golden, Colorado, that switched over to the four day work week. So they are doing police, fire, all governmental employees work a four day work week. Um, but they just, the, the the analogy of Thursday is the new Friday is that we don't have to have it be Fridays. There, there's some businesses that it wouldn't make sense for that. You know, that Fridays are maybe their most productive day. Um, but to look right. at like, how are we going to do that? So for example, Kalamazoo Valley Community College, a small little community college, Southwest Michigan. Um, this is one of my favorite stories from the book. This guy, Ted Forrester, he's just like an HVAC instructor, total blue collar guy. If you saw him on campus, you'd think he's just a janitor, but he's like, he knows huge HVAC systems for large colleges, things like that. He realizes that um, there's not too many people on campus on Fridays. And that if they turned off the AC, um, they could probably save millions of dollars. And so he advocates to the board why don't we just give everyone Fridays off in the summertime, turn off the whole HVAC system like Thursday at 5 p.m., turn it back on early morning Monday. They end up saving millions of dollars. They end up retaining so many of their staff because who wants to give up like a four-day work week? Um, they weren't working 40 hours in four days. They ended up working 32 hours and they had flexible scheduling. Um, and so it's, it's one of those things where sometimes it's worth just doing an experiment to see because um, what, what ends up happening, and to your point about you know, workload, is there's, there's a few different psychological factors. So one is, it's called Parkinson's Law. So Parkinson um, was a researcher uh, from the UK. One part of his discovery is often reported and the other part isn't. The part that's usually reported is that work expands to the time given. So you're in college, you remember that you have a paper due the next day, you've got four hours to get this thing written, you get it written, might not be your best work, but you get it done. If you have four weeks to do it, it takes you four weeks. Same sort of thing with you know any deadline. The side of Parkinson's law that's rarely reported on is the natural bloating of organizations. He found, he evaluated the British Navy. He looked at if anything were added to a system, a signature, a form, a sign off, an approval, that it's near impossible to pull that signature back out of that system once it's added. So there's a natural mm -hmm. bloating over time of systems. So this thing that, you know, to launch, you know, one of the British Navy boats used to be one person sign off, then something happens, they add something else in. They just assume that all those signatures are needed and now it takes, you know, 15 years to launch this boat. Um, and so what happens if we take those two things together and we give ourselves less time to work on things What's going to happen? So we are now working four days instead of five. We now allow the best things to rise to the surface. So if Jay, I said you got to take one day extra off per week, you're probably going to do the best return on investment time. It's going to make you the most money. It's going to be the most impact. It's going to expand your audience through the podcast. All the piddly stuff that you do that wastes time, you're naturally going to just forget to do. Um, and so what happens is that bloating that's natural in an organization. Now there's a spotlight on that where you can then say. Maybe I need to eliminate those tasks. Maybe I need to outsource those tasks. Maybe there's some technology that could automate those tasks that I shouldn't be doing. Now we naturally become more and more streamlined because we're giving ourselves less time to do the same amount of work. I hadn't heard the second part. Uh, it's, it's interesting. I, I really think this is really, really valuable from a perspective. You know, because I was thinking about like in the game industry, one of the 
it's so interesting because one of the studios that is very well known, I'm not going to do a name, but one of the studios that's very well known for the quality of their products, they're, they're known as a genre king. So if you're listening and you know video games, you know exactly who I'm talking about. They have a very precise design process about how they go through things. Lots of reviews, like it's looking all, all the way up and down the thing. A lot of it is thematically. They do a lot of experimentation. They're kind of doing all that kind of jazz. Lately, the quality of what they produce has just been, they're getting pinged like tons about the quality of what they're producing, right? I'm even thinking about this. At the time of this recording, the Star Wars hotel experience is basically under fire, right? And I and when I think about Disney and I think about creating a physical attraction, I'm not even talking about their content right now, but just a physical attraction, they are the penultimate version of a physical attraction, right? They know how to do that. The Imagineer work is like amazing and it just flopped. It's, it's failed. The experiment failed in the Star Wars world or whatever the heck it's called, Um and I think about what you said there with Parkinson's, I'm kind of like, oh, interesting. I wonder if that creativity is just now being stifled because of these steps. Mm-hmm. So this is making me reflect a little bit on the parenting discussion. So, right, the work expansive time it takes to do it, right? There's that whole piece. One of the great things I love about uh, my oldest daughter is that, and it's something, this is one of those unteachables. She has an incredible sense of urgency. So it's like, if she's got a chore, it's like, how can I get this done so I can go do this other thing that I love? Like that's something you can't teach. And it's amazing. It's amazing to watch. Um, But of course, now I'm thinking of what's the bloat? Like what's the bloat in my house that's preventing us from living our best lives? And for those that are listening, I just did air quotes around best lives because yeah, uh, because that term. So what do you think about that, Joe? Live your best life. (laughs) Yeah. Um, You know, I think that, looking, it's good to have a reset or a recalibration in a family, you know, to just look at where are we spending our time and what are we doing here? Um, There's times when we need to do some permission giving around, you know what, this weekend, we all need to go on an adventure and forget the laundry, forget the dishes. You know, we're going to just say, we've had these checklists for you and it's not working. Um, I, I think that doing check-ins with the family to say, let's step out of this system and just say like, what are we doing here? Um, And just say, here's what I want. I I like, so for me personally, let's, we'll just, I'll get personal. I want the main areas of my house to not be majorly cluttered. Now it's fine if it's lived in, it's fine if people leave out scissors, I'm not like catalog house, but I also don't want crap all over the place all the time. Uh, And so what that looks like is, we have two terms. One is blitz and one is party ready. So we're going to blitz the house. We're going to set a timer. We're going to turn on fun music and we're going to go crazy. And it may be that everyone gets everything put away or by the end of it, like yesterday, because we have, we have a party today for my daughter. Um, a lot of that stuff is going in a box for them to sort on the weekend. And so Mm -hmm. it's, we're going to blitz it in a period of time. We're done with it. And then we can move on now. Party ready that means we are getting this house ready for a party. And so yesterday we blitzed and party ready. Um, but it's like being able to just say, what's the reset here uh, in regards to how it looks, in regards to what our expectations are. Um, when the most amount of tension t- t- tends to happen in families is when there's some sort of expectation that's not set, um, it's assumed, and then someone doesn't meet that undisclosed you know, intention that they want. So I want the house ready for this party. I made one non-direct, you know, comment to my daughters about, I wish, boy, I wish the house was cleaner, expecting them to know what that means. And then they went and they went on their iPad for their half hour each day. And then I get mad about that. And it's like, no, I didn't say we have a party tomorrow. Girls get off your iPads. We're going to clean for 30 minutes. I'm being very clear with that. Kids just need more of that clarity. And I mean, so do partners. So do like, if we don't articulate what we actually want and then we're frustrated that people don't do it, like that's on us. Cause we didn't communicate. I love this. I, uh, I think I learned this in this book. So for those of you listening, I'm flashing Will Godero's unreasonable hospitality. And, and I believe one of the comments was literally about this was about, are you making a statement with the expectation of the other person 
that the other person understands what you're saying. And I too did this recently. I actually have been working through it with my wife. And I just said, you know, I realize, let's say it's like, um, uh, I, I really, I'm on a computer stuff. So I have years of this. And I, I just, I enjoy it when she does my forearms and my wrists, when she just kind of massages them or touches them or in some capacity. And I realized it was like, I was using that negative expectation statement a lot to get that attention. And then, and then I said, I said, you know what? I realize I'm doing this. I want to enroll you in this journey with me. What I'm trying to do is say, I would like for you to do X, whether that's, you know, we just use an example of the kids. I would like for us to clean the house together because tomorrow mm -hmm. X, but for her to say, like, Hey, I would like this physical attention from you, blah, blah, blah. And then I recognize like in that moment, cause my head was like, this doesn't mean you have to do what I say. You can still say no. Cause you still say no. It just means this is what I would like. And if you say no, cool then I just deal with that. I just deal with the fact that yeah. you said no. Doesn't mean you're rejecting me. It just says right now, you don't want to do that, which is fine, right? You, <laughs> you're allowed to do that kind of thing. Uh, but the other perspective, I was like, oh, it's so great. I'm communicating what I want, right? Yeah, and I think that there, there's the a thing. Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Uh, there's a great book called The Scream Free Marriage. And one thing he talks about in that is that effective couples each try to come honestly to each other. So for example, Hey, Claire, like, I want to go out to dinner Friday. What do you want? Oh, I don't know. What do you, I could, I guess I could do Chinese. Well, I'm not sure if I, I just had Chinese. It's like, it's like, what are you saying here? Like, so versus, you know, what? I would love to go have French food down at Amakal. Okay. I just had French food. I don't really want French food, but I would really like to try that new Asian place. Okay. Now we can have a conversation. She wants Asian. I want French. Uh, and we can actually debate or discuss what that looks like as a couple versus all this back and forth that's all fluffy and like what do you are you saying you don't want asian food like what are you actually saying here so i i love what you're saying that we're we're just coming to the table saying here's what i would like i would like a massage i had such a tough day on the computer and then she may say i love you and i would love to give you a massage but i just did a crazy workout today and my fingers just can't do that okay now we can have a discussion around that uh, thanks for that. And I love the example of the food because we do that all the time. I, I stop both my oldest and my wife now, which is like, oh, what are we going to do for dinner? I'm like, no, we're not playing this game. I want you to tell me what you want so we can evaluate what we all want together. Because if, if, if one of us is just kind of putting out different ideas, then we're just going to do something or just say what I don't want. Like you start with that, like, here's what I don't yeah. want. To eat. Like, I don't want to have hamburgers. I don't want a salad tonight. I don't want these things. So we can build that. And it, and it does create a, a much quicker resolution. Uh, I have a quick hack I want to really... share around that. Oh. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Um, we have a shared, we have two shared notes in our phones. And one is date night ideas and one is kid date night ideas. Um, and so whenever we're talking like, oh, we haven't tried that new Crocodile Palace place we drop it in the note because when you're, when you're thinking like, what should we do for dinner tonight? We don't always remember that. And so mm. then we can say, okay, we're going to pick something from our date night ideas. We have to go to one of these 12 places we've talked about wanting to try over the last month. And then it's like, okay, we're not at that same point of like, should we do this? Should we not do this? Um, same with kid date night ideas. If we have a free evening that we're going to look at the kid date night ideas and be like, okay, we all wanted to go bowling and then make s'mores afterwards. It's some more bowling night. And so it just takes away that brainstorming that usually leads us to just like watching Netflix. And I, I love this as well, because it's at the end of the day, we've been typically kids have been at school as parents, we've been working um, maybe or maybe not, but we've spent expended at willpower, that mental energy. And now we're going to do something that's going to rejuvenate us, help us build a great relationship. Um, and we've, and we've outsourced that. So then we're evaluating what's on the list instead of trying to come up with on the spot. Absolutely love it. And, uh, I do definitely want to come back to that concept of boundaries. This is something that you said off air. I'm really interested in it. What are soft and hard boundaries? Yeah. So oftentimes when we think about boundaries, we, we think about it as pass fail. So I don't do this. I do do that. Now that can be true. Boundaries can be that you're a married guy. You know, I'm assuming you as a married man have boundaries around what that means to you and your wife. So there are boundaries that are definitely pass fail and you know, you can or can't do. With hard and soft boundaries, we're thinking about what do we want out of our life? So a soft boundary, we might want to call that an experiment. We might want to call that an aspiration. Um, so a soft boundary for me 
might be on Mondays. I don't want to have to talk to my team at all. I'm going to try to take that off a little bit more. I take Fridays off, but Mondays, I just maybe want to do an hour of email. But, you know, if something big comes up, I can be flexible in that area. You know, with your kids, it might be, hey, let's try to do game night every Wednesday for a while. We're not going to be militant about it, but we're going to just try to move towards that, maybe calling it an intention. Hard boundaries are going to be things that we say, okay, we really want to hold this fast. So I wrote a book called Thursday is the New Friday. If my team is working like crazy on Fridays, that's a bit hypocritical. Or if I take on a mm -hmm. consulting client and they only can meet on Fridays, I'm never going to take that client on because I wrote a book about three-day weekends and I really value my Fridays and getting the house in order and getting things in order, getting my head straight before my kids are out of school. So having those hard boundaries. Um, with soft boundaries, a way to test some is doing this exercise called the plus one minus one exercise. And so what you do is you think about, okay, this coming weekend, Jay, we want this to be restorative for your next week so that it actually rejuvenates you and you're more, you're better able to go into the week instead of having it be in reaction to the week before. Like, oh, I'm so tired from the week. I need to sleep in. I'm going to have a couple extra drinks. And then the week starts off rough. So with the plus one, minus one, we're going to add one thing in to our weekend that we think might be able to help us feel a little better. So I want to drink green tea on Saturday morning and read this, you know, fiction novel that I'm really into that has no business aspirations at all. It's just for fun. Now you need to talk to your wife, talk to your kids and be like, dad's going to drink his green tea, green tea and just read for an hour. Uh, and then at the end of it, you're like, I don't really feel that much better than I thought I was going to feel. Uh, or you say, oh, that felt great. So you start to build out this list of things that you can pepper into, into your weekends. The minus one is the opposite. What could you take off of your schedule that might make you feel a little better? Maybe you're sick of doing grocery shopping on the weekends and you're going to get your groceries delivered. Maybe you're going to, you know, this week outsource your lawn to the neighbor kid to just see if you feel better not having to mow the lawn every weekend. Um, and then you start to build this list of things that are potential soft boundaries where you say, okay, I'm going to now start to say, you know, every Saturday, I want to pick something from that soft boundary list from that minus one plus one and see if it then helps me feel a little more alive, a little bit better of a parent, a little better you know, spouse, um, better human. Um, and it's an iter iter iterative process. Um, the industrialist taught us that if you plug it in, at the end, you're going to get a Model T. It's very predictable. You know, people are like machines. You plug it in, you get something on the other end. We are so far past that, where we understand the nuance of humanity. We understand that it's not a recipe, but it's more of a menu. And so we want to build out that menu where we can say, what are the things that give me more life than maybe I was anticipating? Joe, I think us in the Feel Good Fatherhood community are learning a heck of a lot more about you, your principles, and your philosophy of life. <laughs> so I, I think that uh, one of the things for me as I was listening to you talk about life was when I wake up in the morning, I sit down on my couch. We have a sitting room. The sitting room faces east. And so the sun rises. I get to watch the sun rise, get to look at the sky, practice a little bit of gratitude, be super grateful that um, number one, we have gravity. Number two, that gravity has created and our, what, I don't even know what you call it, but that is it not the hydrosphere, but the atmosphere that that creates the blue scrot blue sky that I have green and then blue and it looks beautiful. And I'm, I'm just enjoying that. And so that is a menu of my life. That is something that I absolutely love. And, um, it, it's super great. And here, just when you said life is a menu, not a recipe. I think that as fathers, I, I don't know if there's any other really effective way to really approach your family and your life in a really healthy way, right? There's a handful of things that you, that are you, that make up who you are, your uniqueness, your expertise, your skills, and you want to transfer as many of them as possible, right? You have this intention and your kids are going to take, maybe, maybe your kids are going to take six to 12 things from you right? Three things that you intend, probably six things that you don't, and then three things that you really didn't want them to grab, <laughs> right? <laughs> the menu of them watching and turning and, and doing all that kind of jazz. And um, uh, I just think it's really, really interesting. And I, and I love that, that individual philosophy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, as we, 
enter in, you know, as, as people that are going to listen to this podcast, oftentimes they're probably high achievers, people that want to be a good father, want to do it right. Um, there's a lot of pressure that we put on ourselves and, and to do it right. And I remember there was a child therapist that worked for me and it was right after my kid, my second child was born. I was just basically like, I feel like I'm going to screw this kid up. And she said something along the lines of, and I, I won't get the research exact, but it was along these lines that if you're a good parent 30% of the time, assuming you don't do major traumatic things like the ACEs scores and abuse your kids. But like, if you're, if you're on like 30% of the time, your kid's going to be just fine. And for me, it was like a breath of fresh air. Like, okay, I can do 30%. I mean, I would hope I would do way more than 30%. But right. like if at minimum it's like, okay, I'm intentional. I'm really on my game. I'm trying to like create adventures for them. And you know, part of the time I'm just tired. And like we watch The Mandalorian. <laughs> it's like, it's right. not screwing them up, but you know, it's probably not the best decision if we do it. But you know, it's like, we don't have to always have every moment be this perfect Instagram parenting moment that just showing up, being intentional, um, showing that we care about our kids, you know, oftentimes that's more than enough. Love it, Joe. So if, if some of the feel good fathers want to get a hold of you or learn more about you and what you're doing, where can they go? Yeah. So we have the practice of the practice podcast. Uh, it's not just for therapists. We cover all sorts of business and life things on that podcast. Um, I do consulting uh, with businesses to help them grow in kind of whatever ways they're looking to grow. Um, usually it's around the four day work week um, or leveling up in some way uh, into whether it's influencing or, you know, doing public speaking or writing books. Um, they can just contact me over at practice of the practice.com forward slash apply. Awesome. Joe uh, Sanuk, everybody.